You've mentioned before the North Korean conflict, and that has been a huge topic of the past months, or year even now. Um, Japan has been one of those countries which has always been threatened by the North Korean nuclear threat, as it was called before. But despite that, at the current discussions, particularly after um, Kim Jong-un met Ban Ki-moon, um, as well as uh, Donald Trump, Japan seemingly seem passive, not involved in these whole discussions. That's at least my statement toward that position. What would your perspective be on that? I think uh, this is a very unique uh, event for Japanese diplomacy. Uh, I would like uh, to uh, encourage, uh, remember what, what, what is the essence of Japan and U.S. security pact. Uh, of course, protection of Japanese I mean, the uh, territory is others. And the second is uh, the uh, American troops' uh, maneuverability stationed in Japan to uh, be able to, in a more effective way, dealing with Asia-Pacific events from, of course, the strategic point of view. These are the combined, I mean, uh, this uh, Japan-US security pact. Uh, there was, uh, I think, pretty useful and uh, effective for at least for us, I mean, uh, Japanese security. And also, I mean, uh, uh, end of the day, for Asian security. It has worked. But uh, politically, it has been all the way, therefore, uh, from the same reason, very vulnerable. Attacks from right, attacks from left. Because two different kind of the, so reasoning for this very, in a sense, not big treaty uh, is uh, really uh, poured into uh, this only one kind of the treaty. And therefore, it's so difficult to defend and so difficult uh, to really, I mean, make everything safe from potential threat from right, from left. And then what, I mean, this uh, security treaty has envisaged why, end of the day, this treaty is needed for what? One is Taiwan, another one is Korean Peninsula. Because at that time already, Japanese and Americans, we have 100% agreement. If Japan would be somehow threatened by real kind of threat, then it's a really threat to American interest in this area. And where are the most likely places those kind of events could eventually happen, in spite of all efforts to prevent them? Then at the time, Taiwan, Taiwan Strait, and the Korean Peninsula. So that was always the target earlier where this treaty has been always pointing and working very hard. So that sense, against background, Japan has been always prepared for even this today's, I mean, quote, quote, I mean, event. And therefore, I think Japan and Americans, not only political levels, bureaucracy and the militaries, have been so close and uh, probably from outsider, uh, then Japan looks very small, even somehow like that. But the reality is Japan has been always part of that. I think I, of course, it doesn't mean American interest, Japanese interest are always the same. Of course not. America has its own, her own goal and objectives. Japan has different objectives. But uh, I mean, the majority of those interests overlapping. And that, that is the reason why we have been really keeping this alliance. And, uh, but I think this new administration, as I said, diplomacy not necessarily working well. I mean, especially on another part of, I mean, the uh, so partner party. Because uh, for my, I mean, uh, colleagues, they do have still no counterpart in the uh, State Department or in the Pentagon. So then the question is, event is there, event could happen, Political show happen, but how to really, I mean, create sustainable negotiation 
and leading to some substantive solution of this issue. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has announced that he would like to meet Kim Jong Un in September. Now you're saying that the diplomatic um, actions from Japan have been relatively unsuccessful. Particularly, Japan has also um, emphasized that it's going to keep its sanction towards North Korea if there's not going to be denuclearization, as well as this hold of the abductions. What kind of goals or achievements we might see at that summit when Shinzo Abe, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and Kim Jong-un actually are going to meet? What's Japan's point if the sanctions as well as the diplomatic situation is going to be the same? Well, uh, I know uh, that is a little headline of newspapers, but uh, my personal kind of sense uh, tells me that it doesn't happen in a quite new future. And uh, it means at least uh, until this uh, midterm election in America and others. Um, I don't think that I mean, this kind of summit meeting between North Korea and Japan very unlikely happens. And I think this is good uh, probably for Prime Minister Abe himself. He tried to, uh, I'm not part of the government, so of course I'm not well informed about. Uh, so I am a little bit cautious about saying kind of final word, but I think it might be good for him as political leader to buy time and to give the sense, oh, I'm an impression, I am part of that, until he will be re-elected to a three-time election of, I mean, the president of ADP or something like that. I mean, all, I mean, the leaders of all countries have international agenda, but rather domestic agendas. Thank you very much for that. To wrap this up, I'm just going to ask you about your predictions for the next five years of Japanese foreign policy. What do you see is the future of Japanese foreign policy in pursuit of peace and stability in the next five years? I think uh, it will be a very challenging time for Japan. And uh, I think once I mean Japan could be really as, uh, as you I borrow your kind of the terminology, part of I mean, the movement, part of the events, then I think we need probably a little more innovative and we are a little bit more showy in a, I mean, a clever way. Uh, so that, I mean, so I mean, when we're talking about, for example, sled, then a traditional uh, kind of the so measurement of country A is really, I mean, a threat or not a threat, then we have two factors. One is uh, objective capacity. How many battleships? How many are the bombers? How many what, what do you have? Then with those weaponry, then what you can, I mean, uh, do to really attack Japanese interests. This is part one. Part two is intention. So this guy, like uh, Kim Jong, always criticizing, oh, I fire. Uh, Japan and Tokyo will be devastated just I mean, within 10 minutes, something like that. So, but this is really, I mean, the like intention, or just this is, in a sense, rhetoric. So, intention or rhetoric is so difficult to tell. And these days, thanks to mass media, thanks to those kind of tools, we are so good at, I mean, kind of lip diplomacy. Right. And this, but not necessarily always reflecting your own real intention. And then why Japanese people have not been panicked until today, uh, even, I mean, the objective situation are not necessarily good, or even, I mean, the lip diplomacy are really the worst. But they somehow cool enough First of all, the, uh, this, I mean, uh, the effect of the Japan and U.S. security pact. And there are many American GIs, bases, and we know and how really so closely they have been coordinated, trained, they are prepared. This is one. Second is, I think, we see until now, even this guy, uh, see more kind of lip service 
but not the real intentions. So um, this is always a balance, right? So we need a both. Kind of the uh, so very cool analysis of intention, and another one is a real kind of the capacity to build up for eventuality. And we have been doing both. Plus, as your last question, politicians, all leaders need domestic agendas as well. Thank you very much. Professor Nishida, it has been a pleasure speaking to you today. Thank you so much. Pleasure was mine.